सहनावतु सहनाओ बुनक्तु सहाबीर्यम करवावाई ते जो स्वीनावदी मस्तो माविदिशावाई ओम शांति 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 ही मे दैट वन प्रोटेक्ट अस बोथ मे दैट वन नरेश अस बोथ मे वी वर्क टुगेदर विथ ग्रेट एनर्जी एंड विगर May our study be illumined. May we not unnecessarily cavil with each other. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Anyway, uh, this evening, for some crazy reason, I selected the topic negotiating the maze. Unfortunately, it's a broad enough topic to include many, many things. The origin of the word maze, maze, really means division. And uh, there are there's another uh, word which we can use, um, which really means a network, a network of avenues, and that's normally what we think of. But if we don't know the way out, then or the way to the center of a maze, then we will be certainly confused. So I think a maze is a very good analogy for. Much of our life, much of our life is certain and is directionally certain, but much of it is not. A good example of that is the Irish weather. I, I get the impression that the whole summer we're waiting for summer. So, the weather is a very good example that Sri Ramakrishna also uses. One moment it's sunny and bright, next moment clouds cover. And the analogy is very useful because the sun shining is covered by a cloud, and we can watch with great, great wonder at the beauty of nature, how the sun shining brightly, and a cloud drifts in front of it. And when the cloud moves on, the sun shines again. Sun has been used as a symbol of knowledge. Awareness and consciousness for eons, and has been acknowledged in a worshiping way. Many, many cultures, most cultures, I would say, have taken the sun as some kind of divinity, if not a symbol of the divine, at least that much. We have that passage that he's shining; all things shine. That shining, everything shines. Something is shining, and from that enables other shining things. But they don't just suddenly arrive. If we look at our cosmology, we'll see there's a development. There's a pull. The gravity acts on it. So it's important to know that whatever cosmology you follow, the understanding from the yogis that passes on to the Vedanta tradition is uh, that there is a state of avyakta. That is unmanifest state. We call it agasha. We can also call it a field, not a field that you grow things in, but a field meaning some kind of amorphous uh, area, as it were, where waves vibrate, where waves interact. Uh, where waves are waves. An example of this is the electromagnetic wave system, where there's a whole spectrum of waves, including the visible waves, as well as ultraviolet, infrared, as well as gamma rays, X rays, and so on, all operating at different frequencies. It seems that there is one thing, and when the frequency changes, then we have. Some different manifestation of it, and this field, the ancient people call agasha. And when energy acts on it, then a manifestation occurs progressively. 
when gravity acts, gravity, a force, what we call prana and energy acts on this stuff that we call agasha in potentiality, in potential, potential energy, it becomes kinetic. And kinetic energy, because of its movement, results in radiation. And radiation results in a state of liquidity, plasma. And that ultimately becomes something that is solid. And so this was the way the ancient people looked at it. It's also the way modern science looks at it, denoting different kinds of energy, from gravitational energy to kinetic energy, to radiational energy, to electromagnetism. The only thing is that the modern scientists combine the last two in one thing, electromagnetism. And then there's an additional thing, nuclear forces. The ancients didn't really come across the nuclear forces so much, but I think we'll find that they are variations of electricity and magnetism anyway. Something like an atomic energy, which is electrical in its behavior, and electromagnetic, something that we call spin. So subatomic particles have got a spin, similar to magnetic orientation. And there we find the weak and strong nuclear forces. But why am I saying all of this? It's because most of what is here, we can't trace with our senses. We have no idea that it is here. We take for granted that our world, which is essentially a sense-bound, sense-reliant world, only seen through eyes at a certain wavelength, heard through the ears at a certain, a certain sonic vibration, felt by the skin because the skin is sensitivity, and so what we call a reality here, we can register as a relative reality. It requires something else to pick it up and register it. And the ultimate registering faculty we have is called the mind. So when we denote various categories in the universe, we have to take into account the objects of the sense organs. We have to take in the, into account the sense organs themselves, which come in two varieties, an incoming source to be sorted out where the real sense organs, which we call indriyas, the real sense organs are internal to the mind and the instrumental things are eyes, ears, etc. Without the internal organs and without the attention attached to it, we have no experience. And when the external organs shut down, the internal, in, the external instruments shut down, the internal organs have their field, have their day, they play. We call it a dream. And when all of those are down, then we call this deep sleep, the rising and setting of the organs, the equivalent to the rising and setting of the mind, until finally a poised area of potential creativity sits there. We call this peace otherwise called deep sleep. So this is a kind of a maze. When we look at all the external events in the world, we are sometimes puzzled by their erratic nature. All of a sudden something happens. And if we're interested in tuning into the news, we'll see it's, it won't be news if it's the same thing every day. Something unusual or erratic has to occur. And then we pick it up. So the nature of nature itself is one of erratic, one of strange things happening, unexpected events, sudden things happening, sometimes caused by us, sometimes caused by nature itself operating in a causal way as it should be, filling in the gaps and having no regard or sensitivity to how we react or to our evaluations. And so this maze in the sense of a kind of delusion, that is, an, that is a very good analogy. Labyrinth is the other name for it, which means so many avenues. And I don't know when mazes were constructed in gardens, but there are two types. One, 
there's an entrance and you have to work out where is the exit. If this is an analogy for life, we know where we got in. The problem is we didn't get in in the beginning. It's like going into a drama or a play. We didn't arrive at the beginning. We're not going to stay to the end. We have to make out what's happening in between. And we are given sufficient intelligence and curiosity to work out where we are going and where we should not go and where we should go. And in a true maze, therefore, there's an entrance, there's an exit, but another kind of maze is there where you have to discover where the center is. We also have to understand where our center is. What do we mean by that? Supposing we take these sense organs as exterior, the internal dimension of it would be the sense instruments. Or the other way around, if we take the sense instruments there, which are the eyes and so on, and take the sense organs as internal, whatever description you like to give it, there's an interiority increasing the more subtle things go until we come to something that is what we call loosely mind. I saw a joke some years ago. It said, I used to be open-minded, but then my brains fell out. Because often we equate mind with brain, and we won't get into that argument because mind is simply subtle matter, and matter is gross mind. And so whether we argue about its materiality from a brain point of view or otherwise, it seems to be pointless. We will all agree that it is all matter in one form or another. But as we increase the subtlety of it, we see that there is an evaluating capacity, a choosing capacity. We can stand back and faced with options, we can make a decision. There are scientific experiments that have tried to say that equating mind with brain that uh, we actually uh, react first and then we think about it. But the, unfortunately, the evaluations were more to do with instinctive actions, such as a fly lands on my cheek, instinctively I uh, move my hand. So naturally, the registration on the fly comes first, the hand movement comes second. But what about a longer term thing? where we have to really sort out a puzzle, or where we have to really evaluate something properly, and on the basis of information, make an informed decision about something, rightly or wrongly. You know, there's that statement, a bad decision is better than no decision at all. And we are faced with these choices all the time, not just now and then. We don't normally register it in this way because all of these evaluations happen very, very quickly. Amazingly, whatever we see and however we register it and identify it is done in a flash, a flash of a flash. We hardly notice it, and yet there is a whole complex mechanism going on, and it requires an intelligence at the end of it, which makes an executive decision, rightly or wrongly. And if we don't exercise that, we fall into a morbid state, dominated by one of the components of nature that we have as part of the discovery of the yogis and the sankhyas and so on, called gunas, binding elements, that the whole of the life is made from these three interwoven connections. These various forces, they're not just forces, they're not just qualities, there's some substance behind them, just as every movement is this combination of matter and energy. So these gunas are substantive. You can't say qualities alone because you can't have a quantity of a quality. You can't say, give me a cup of whiteness. You'll have to say, please tell me, Swami, is it white paint? Is it uh, white milk? What do you want? So some substance has to be there, and when this is all combined, then this is something like the construction of a maze, something that is carefully designed, 
and we know our way through the maze in certain circumstances or the labyrinth in certain circumstances but others we don't know and when it comes to interior life because of its subtlety very often we don't know what we do know is there are objective values we know it's not good to just become angry and kill somebody we know that and many materialists will say oh, that's just Com compounded experience for our survival but others will say no there's something deeper than that there's a higher value that is an echo or a symptom of an internal essence and that internal essence has been described as something that absolutely exists not like the relative reality that we've been describing up to now where something exists for a moment and passes on. And so the ancient philosophers would have had a definition, what is real? You know, ask that question, they say something that is impermanent and fleeting is not real because something that appears and disappears is something like a magic show. And this magic we call Maya is a technical term for it. Now Maya is not exactly an illusion, Maya is just a statement of fact that things are not quite, quite what they seem to be. And Maya is said to be inscrutable. And what modern science is investigating is Maya, and they won't come to an end to it. And we've seen that with the most profound and beautiful discoveries of the 20th and 21st centuries, all expressing themselves as technolo technological, technological marvels that increase our communication swiftly and our efficiency increases as well to some extent because there are always two sides to the coin there are always pros and cons one thing in our favor is increased technology has helped us to communicate quicker has helped us so that we know we are one family and has also helped us to uh, get information quicker and it has helped us to, uh, to uh, increase our efficiency in what we do. We, can't, we don't have to rely on the old technology. It wasn't so long ago that if you wanted to get from point A to point B, you took a new invention called a horse and carriage or a coach and you could get there to a place maybe within five or six days and the horses were swift and there were change stations where you stopped and quickly the horses were changed and the old ones refreshed and you carried on it was seen to be a marvelous invention in fact when the motor car came along people said it'll never catch on you know <laughs> this thing moving at four miles an hour you know yes it's a nice contraption it's fun and all the rest of it, but we can't see it catching on. And all those people stuck with the old technology were stuck indeed. So one thing we have to see in the relative world is we have to embrace change. And that means to solve the puzzle of the maze in which we live, we have to learn to shift our awareness in different and unusual ways. And we have the capacity to do that. If you look at something from 20 points of view, there are 20 possible solutions to a problem. Maybe one of them will fit, maybe none of them will fit. But in a moment where the mind is continuously unconsciously thinking, a solution pops up. And we have the expression, it came to me. Well, where did it come from? Was it like a rocket that hit my head or something? No. Somehow something arose in me. Where did it come from? It come, came from an unknown, unconscious area that sits underneath the unconscious mind itself and operates and continues thinking. An operation of life itself that comes from a life giver. That's the inference. And the more we go inward, the more expansive our knowledge. What are some of the contrary things, some of the minuses in our modern science and modern technology well we have learned to scatter 
our awareness, our attention. We have learned to walk down a street doing thumb exercises on the telephone. We have learned that there are so many things that can catch the attention of the senses and drag us in a hundred different directions. And this has created a general feeling of dissatisfaction, of uns unsettlement, naturally. Something that is scattered in all of the place, something that is confusing, will engender confusion. And so what is our answer? These ancient yogis would have said, concentration. Why don't you gather all of this energy that is scattered everywhere? Why don't you center it? After all, you do it unconsciously anyway. You hear a beautiful piece of music, that's where your attention goes. You hear somebody blaming you, criticizing you, that's where your attention goes. You're certainly wide awake. There are, in every household, an old uncle or a father possibly in his dotage, resting his eyes, that's the description, he's probably sleeping, but he'll just he'll say, no, resting my eyes, and will be oblivious to all the conversation until you mention his name, and then he'll be highly alert. What, me? What are you saying about me? We can easily divert our attention just for a moment. We've all experienced it. So we have the capacity to increase that more and more systematically through discipline, through taking the mind and carefully steering it in a chosen direction. And it need not be unpleasant. In fact, if it's unpleasant, if it's a struggle, it's only a beginning phase. But as we get used to it, then it becomes more pleasant. It's like rolling something up a hill. At a, some point, the downward motion is there, which is easy and natural. We can then glide, our attention then starts gliding across borders, becomes a delightful exercise, something like a game. So how do we deal with this maze of life? Not get out of it. That would be some people's approach because it can produce many kinds of feelings. There are positive feelings that are possible, such as curiosity, but there can also be impatience and despair. How can I get out of this? Maybe a feeling of panic can come. There could be a quality of determination that could be engendered. Or the opposite, exasperation. There could be anger. Who made this stupid maze, this labyrinth? Or we could take it with a sense of fun, take it as an adventure and enjoy the process. And in order to really deal with it, we have to have self-confidence that we can find a way, that there is a way out or there is a center, depending on how your labyrinth is constructed. So we have to see what in our maze would be a cul-de-sac and not go there a second time. You know, in a maze, we could say, oh, there's, a, there's an, a dead end. It's not going anywhere. And a good maze is constructed so that the height you can't peep across. And so you go back and work out. If you're clever, you might leave an object there so that if you arrive at it again, you're, oh, no, I've definitely been here before. You uh, may meet a confused soul who's also on this journey. And you may ask him, did you go this way? Did you go that way? You can use his or her experience and vice versa. And in life, there are souls like this. You say, I see that you had this experience. I, I won't do that myself, even though probably you may fall into the same trap, trap anyway. So we learn as we go. And we've been learning all our lives for many lives, coming to the state of humanity which is an accumulation of all our past experience as individuals also. And this is where we've arrived with so many talents, so many skills, with a body so well equipped, so finely tuned, so perfect. There's no reason for it to be diseased except for maybe wrong thinking, wrong eating, or 
you know, wrong elimination or any one of these things. So we have a beautiful body, we have a, an acute instrumental uh, capacity, the internal instrument called antakarana, otherwise popularly called the mind. We have this to use, to investigate, to evaluate, to promote, to tune, or to drag down as we want. And the choice is a free choice. It's up to us. And in the maze or a labyrinth, we can't really see around the next corner. What fun would that be? So when something unexpected comes to us, well, we should expect the unexpected and greet it like an old friend. But you see, if you're in a hurry and you want to get out of this quickly, then it's not going to work. It has to be done patiently, progressively. And while you're there, it has to be done with the intention for which it was constructed. It wasn't constructed as an imprisonment for you or an awkwardness for you. All of these things were constructed in these beautiful uh, gardens for noble people and the nobility and the elite for amusement, for fun. Now, if you don't have time on your hands, then it might not be fun. But we all have time because we all wake up and we all sleep. And in between, we have time to do whatever we want. So time, in fact, is an opportunity for all of us. It can be broken down into seconds, like blank checks, never been used before. Will we put something useful into it? Will we take advantage of the labyrinth? And when we take, when we know where the exit is or where the center is, then we have also the freedom to go back and show other people, this is the way you go, not this way. These are the teachers, those who have found the outlet and who can guide us further. Then there will be misdirections as well. Those who say, oh, you have to go this way, go left. And in fact, when you go left, you come to a cul-de-sac and you should have gone right. So maybe we should be selective about who we listen to. But eventually we'll all get out. Eventually we can go down every single avenue you can think of and finally go out. There are, there's the story about some people who were involved in a labyrinth and they didn't know how to get out. And one person said, I don't know how to go. I get out. I went this way and that way. I don't know the way. The other person says, no, I don't know the way either. But the third person had one of these rocket, rockets on his back, and he went up in the air and went out, and they both declared, oh, that's the way. That's, who, that's the way we should have done it. And so we do have that capacity to elevate the mind and see things from an overview position, a transcendent position. Now let us put it in religious terms. Why don't we sit on God's throne and see things as he sees them? He has, or he or she or it, has that unique position of sitting there and knowing already in advance everything omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. These are the three omnis that we give a personal God or an overview God or a God of the universe, a cosmological entity. The Vedanta says such a thing exists, such an entity exists, but you have to go further. And that further is a witness, a knower, a thinker. That is your own true nature, your own self. What Meister Eckhart called the Godhead as opposed to the God. And every mystic found this going, this transition from duality to unity a mystic union taking place. And this is the way, this is the way out of the maze. But we have to learn the art of negotiating through it. And we can call this maze or this relative reality Maya. 
So let us see what do we mean by this Maya and how does it arise? Why should it be there? And of course, how to negotiate it successfully. So how is it that one takes the material universe and its objects to be real in the first place is a good question. Is it my fault? What should I do? How have unsubstantial names and forms come into existence is a fundamental lifelong question asked for millennia. And if ultimate reality is one, why do we see the relative world as a duality or a multiplicity? And what is the relationship between this one and the many? So all of these questions are puzzling questions, something such as we would deal with in a maze or a labyrinth. These are questions that philosophers have asked, thinkers have asked, even scientists have asked. And from time out of, uh, from time out of mind have proposed varying replies. Let's deal with one of them. One of them says there is a God that created this. Like a carpenter created a piece of furniture or a potter making a pot from clay. Another may say, no, some believe that God or the power itself has become the universe. Something like a universal cosmic body is there and there is a manifestation of that being as the world itself. That would be one position. And thus the, the cause of the universe doesn't really lie outside the universe because in the first position you have to have an extra cosmic creator entity and that itself causes problems because as i always say the next question is where why, where is and why is the material and second-hand shop that god went to to get his materials and who made that and who made that now you're into an infinite regression you can't say ex nihilo out of nothing Nothing doesn't exist. So this is an absurd position, actually. And yet it's a position that is used, and it's not that it should not be used, but it is a starting position, a crude position. And the second position is a much more tenable position. It doesn't deny the first position. You see, what is Vedanta? Vedanta is always a position, a philosophical, philosophical position of plus. This world is only matter. It looks like that. Yes, I agree. It is matter, but there's more. Or it looks like a series of ideas. It looks like that. And I agree. Plato was right. There are forms, but there's more. Materialism, idealism. Yes, we don't say no. Yes, but there's more. All right, then is there uh, some kind of uh, cosmic mind, some kind of personal God that we can pray to that intervenes in human affairs? Yes, absolutely, but there's more. Oh, is there an impersonal entity that sits there in potentiality, a prime mover, a causal agent, a causal entity? Yes, but there's more. And then ultimately, is there pure existence, pure consciousness and infinity? Yes. Described as existence, knowledge, bliss, absolute. Yes, there is that. With an apology. What's the apology? Don't take these for, for qualities. Take these for actualities. So if you eliminate the whole relative world, you're not left with a nothing. There is a something there. If you take time away, the conditions for our experience, take time away. You can do an exercise like that. You say, right now we're going to give a photograph where the whole of time stands still. Please comb your hair, do whatever is necessary. Snap. Everybody stands still. Time ceases. At an appropriate moment, you introduce time again. All right, we're rolling again. But what happened when you were static 
There's no experience of movement whatsoever. And without movement, what is there? All right, let's take space away. Let me tell you, please prepare. We're going to take space away. You stood by like statues when we took time away. All movement was stopped. Now we take space away. One, two, three, space is taken away. Well, everything requires space. When you look at something, it occupies space. Without space, you cannot define differentiation between this or that. So that means all objects have gone, have disappeared. We only have a representative concept of this. Something like the sky can represent infinity, or the ocean with an unbounded horizon can represent it, or the blackness of a night sky can represent it. But it's only a representation. Whatever we see within space, there's an inference of something beyond it. And the ultimate beyond will have to be undivided, because dividedness is a space problem. They're unchanging, because change is a time problem. It is infinite. Boundaries are a time-space problem. You take all of these things away, you have not nothing, not ex nihilo. You don't have a naught. You simply have the undivided, the unchanging, and the infinite. And we have no concept about, about it. But we have to, for that reason, create some concepts to lead us there. This is how we negotiate through the maze. Let us see what we have so far. First of all, we can take positive attitudes, the same attitudes we would use if we were challenged with climbing Mount Everest. We wouldn't adopt a sauntering attitude. We'd prepare ourselves well. We would train. Thousands and thousands of people create a nuisance at the base camp of Mount Everest these days, to the extent that it's created littering problems. Of course, the Nepalese government want it to happen. They get paid for it, get money, it's an income. But we're ruining the environment. And not only that, but people not fully prepared fall to their deaths. People not experienced enough fall to their deaths, and even those who are experienced fall to their deaths. The number of deaths that occur on a yearly basis, annual basis in Mount Everest, I don't know exactly what the statistics are currently, but there's a lot of people, and it's tragic. It doesn't stop them coming. So there's a certain thrill about it. Supposing we would take it to take up life with that kind of thrill attitude. A level of positivity that is absolutely exuberant, that is full of a, an adventurous spirit, a sporting attitude, that life is a game. And we didn't come in, we didn't know what the beginning was. We came in the middle of the movie, and we're not going to stay the end. And so we have to spend our energy working out as best we can what's in the middle and enjoying it anyway. So it is not sackcloth and ashes, this system, this approach. It is taking life for its intrinsic inherent beauty that sits behind. That is taking up the second position, not the creative position, which can in fact be offer you a level of dependency and therefore a weakness, but more a vishishta dvita position from uh, Ramanuja, Ramanuja's position. Now, there was a, a great, and still is, a great philosopher, who's actually a Church of England or Anglican minister, Professor Keith Ward. He was at Oxford University. He writes a number of books. He studied Ramanuja, this Vishishta Dvaita philosophy that says, well, maybe everything is a spark of that divine. You don't have a creator that creates something ex nihilo. You don't have that problem of infinite regress. You don't have that problem of dependency. You don't have the mystery of it. And uh, so, the, we are a part of that divinity, and his argument goes like this, and he's Christian. So he has to produce a Christian argument. 
So what he says, and I produced this, uh, this uh, at uh, um, Trinity College where I was invited to talk about the golden rule from the point of view of the Vedanta. And I was quoting uh, Keith Ward and the uh, Anglican chaplain, or the Church of Ireland chaplain, I should say, was astonished. He came and said, oh, I didn't know you read uh, Keith Ward. I said, yes, I, you know, I do read a number of different authors. But what is his point? He starts off with John's Gospel, in the beginning was the word. That prologue is quite clearly referring to a Jesus Christ. There's nobody who reads that who says this is not referring to the Christ. So that means that Jesus was God from the Christian point of view, just from the prologue. Then he reads Paul's letters, about 20 of them. And in those letters he says, so how many times he refers, something like 20 times, you are parts of the body of Christ. That means you're parts of God. <laughs> you're parts of Christ, you're parts of God, according to John's prologue. Simple argument. And he himself studied Ramanuja and saw this, this uh, qualified non-dualism taking place in Christianity. So these two positions can be there. And again, according to some extreme non-dualists, such as Shankaracharya's grand teacher, Godapada, who writes this beautiful commentary, a much bigger commentary, a much bigger karika commentary on the simple 12 verses that are there as the Mandukya Upanishad. Just 12 short verses and a huge vast commentary. And Godapada takes the position of the ultimate non-dual Shankaracharya, who is also a non-dualist, will see things from the relative point of view as well. So this extreme position of the non-dualists are, are there, that there has never been any creation at all, nor has there been any manifestation. It is all just arriving and creating the reaction of you rubbing your eyes because it's something like a mirage in a desert. It is something like the superposition of a snake that is really superimposed on a coiled rope. It is something like a tree stump that appears as a man. And so Brahman alone exists. And everything that is perceived is Brahman. But if a person says that he sees the universe of multiplicity, not as this unity, then he's the victim of this illusion. Because when the truth is known, all this duality and multiplicity will cease. It doesn't exist anymore. And if names and forms really existed, one should be able to connect them by such relationships as cause and effect or substance and attribute. But you see, Shankaracharya's grand teacher, Godapada, in his commentary on this Mandukya Upanishad, which, as I say, is known as Karika, he admirably refuted all the evidence of relationships and he established once and for all, really, in a superb way, the new or the, the 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 idea new to most people but the view that there's no real creation nothing took place actually everything exists because being in reality the non-dual brahman appearing so that there's an apparitional causation and this apparitional causation as opposed to transformational causation is the transformational causation. It means that there's no creation whatsoever in the normal course of events. And I keep giving the example, you know, can you, or asking the question, can you give me an example of something that is dead or some death somewhere? 
nothing is dead and nothing dies, there's only a transformation. Because our physics tells us that a conservation laws are there, nothing is new, nothing can be created or destroyed, whether it be an energy or matter. So the whole thing is a totality. You burn some wood in a fireplace and the wood disappears. Yes, but there's charcoal and the smoke. And if you were to collect all those atoms and do a mass balance, it will all add up to the same mass as the original. It's all in your age. Yeah. So something is transformed all the time. And the universe continues. Something like a kind of steady state situation where nothing new is created and there's always a renewal, a renewal of things. In fact, the ancient cosmology of the Sankhyas and the Yogis and the Vedantins will be that everything goes into the state of unmanifested condition of Yakta and re-emerges again. Now you have two choices, either in totality, the whole thing winds down and winds up again like breathing in and breathing out, that option is there. Or the other option is it happens locally. Some pockets expand, some pockets contract, like that. Some pockets go into a state of dormancy and wait. Other pockets are immediately expanding and go into a creation phase. And it seems that Swami Vivekananda favored the latter. But it doesn't matter either way. There is this diminishing and creating, it's a cyclical cosmology. And today, many people are looking at this cyclical option. Even if you postulate a multiverse, some versions of it may say, right here, right now, some universes are going into that state, that latent state, and some are expressing like this, a kind of bubble universe like this. So this is Gaudapada's extreme view, but Shankaracharya has a different view. Shankaracharya, for him, the universe of names and forms, we can't deny it as a fact. We can't just say it's mere illusion. And I've come across extreme non-dualists. When you're in trouble, they say, don't worry, it's all an illusion. You bang your head against the wall, don't worry, this bump is not there. No, it's there, I feel it. You can't deny this reality. But you see, this is something like a mirage when you wake up. This is apparitional causation. It only appears like that. So we know the origin of the universe. Our Vedantic cosmology says, no, there was no creation event, such as a Big Bang. No, there was no uh, uh, necessary expression of this in reality. And when we say there was no, we're not saying absolute no. We're saying, yes, as far as it goes, but there's more. And as far as that goes, and there's more. Until we ultimately come to go to Pada's position, no doubt. But we lead up to it. We don't deny any reality whatsoever. So what is this Maya made from? I mentioned is made from these three components. To make an apparition, you have to have three things. Something has to be projected, something has to be hidden, and the possibility of something being revealed. So we take one example, the most common one. That is, in the twilight of the day, I go out and I see something coiled up and immediately come to the conclusion, it's a snake. And it may well bite me and fear comes in. Or I attack it, or I run away, but some reaction is there, on the basis that it is a dangerous snake. I could take this uh, point of view if I view life in this way. And very often we do. We put ourselves in one position, combat position or defensive position, and try to deal with life in the opposite corner of people and places and events, and either use a technique of yielding to the event, or attacking it, going toward it, best form of defense is attack, or running away from it, withdrawing from it. But there's another approach. Why don't you try to reveal what is it actually? Why don't you investigate what it is? And when you bring a torch or a light along, 
and you shine it there, when you bring the light of guided attention, when you make the mind your guru, when you bring a person of knowledge and wisdom, please help me. Let's go out into the garden and see what is the size of the snake. Is it dangerous? Is it toxic? Is it poisonous? Is it poised to bite? And the knowing teacher says, I have no fear. Let us investigate as soon as the rays of light fall on this dangerous snake. We are, it was a rope all the time. And fibers at the top look like the mouth. And by, let's say it's a rattlesnake, something at the bottom looks like the tail. But actually, it is a rope coiled up. So what happened? The rope was hidden from me. A snake was projected, and the light of knowledge revealed it. And so everything, every component of this maya, every movement, as it were, of this apparitional causation comes in these three forms that we call gunas. That is, sattva, where there are no obstacles to our vision. It clarifies, it purifies, it reveals, it's a revealer. Tamas, it hides everything. And rajas, it projects things. So this is our apparitional causation. And the rest will simply be transformational causation, not real uh, not real causation, something like a wave, a hollow in a wave in an ocean, causing a peak somewhere that causes a depression somewhere, and so it goes on. But the ocean is always the ocean, and the waves will always continue as waves. And when we discover the essential reality and the totality of the ocean, then we recognize waves are allowed to be there. We don't deny the existence of waves. Let them be there. This is Shankaracharya's position. The Sankhyas, on the other hand, they describe the universe as a modification of nature, Prakriti, something like modern scientists do. And according to them, the cause manifests itself as the effect. But we say, that's all very well. That's what you observe. We're not saying no. We're saying there's more. And they were generous enough to put everything into one umbrella term called Prakriti, nature, or Pradhana, but not generous enough to put the static reality into one thing, instead of saying that we have all, uh, everyone has his own Purusha, you bring it in, in a more generous way and say there's one Purusha, and this is what Vedanta does. It puts everything into one thing and says, actually, there's only one. And it's not just a theory. When you arrive at that unity that is called Brahman, all the other things go. They disappear. And when you come out of that, you are a wiser person. You're not like a sleep where there's a blank off. You go into sleep as a fool and you come out as a fool. And so the Vedantists will use such terms as Avijja, Ajnana, and Prakriti as practically synonymous with what is called Maya, which is inscrutable because it is neither existent nor is it non existent. It is existent for a moment, but ultimately gets removed completely on a realization of the Absolute. And the word Maya generally signifies not just my personal illusion, but a cosmic misunderstanding on account of which Brahman or pure consciousness appears, appears as the creator of the universe. Is there a personal God, a creator? Yes. But it's also an app apparitional. It will also go into its state of latency at the end of a cycle and reemerge at the next cycle. And the whole thing will disappear on the discovery of this unity called Brahman this pure consciousness. The word prakriti or matter or nature is used often to denote maya, so what is the whole of nature, the whole of the cosmos, what is science investigating? Maya. And it is inscrutable. 
Now this inscrutability is a head-scratching moment for modern science that has come very close to this curiosity. And this happens at the very, very minute microscopic levels of quantum mechanics. In the quantum world, things appear and disappear from quantum fields. Things annihilate quickly, an electron comes and immediately another particle comes, an antiparticle comes. So an electron and a positron come, quickly meet, kiss, and finished in a split second. Now, here's a puzzle. In the whole cosmos, why do we have matter? And there's no trace of antimatter. This is a head-scratching moment. So something else must be at play. Yes, it's inscrutable. You can look at it a million times. You can try and catch a theory of everything. But you see, we've been at this cohesive, constant reconciliation of theories for over a hundred years and not being able to reconcile anything. And we know why. It's inscrutable. It's apparitional. That's all. The ultimate causation is apparitional causation. It looks like something, but it's not. An electron is not a thing. It doesn't do what things do. This is what we call quantum leap, jumping as it were, in Niels Bohr's model of an atom, which is okay for academic uh, graphics, but it has no bearing on reality. And what is reality? Uncertainty. Is uncertainty reality? Yes, we're not sure where everything is. We don't know when something is fixed and we say it's there. We don't know how fast it's going or if it's going at all. And when we try and measure momentum, we have no idea where it is. Only an approximation, mathematically worked out through probability mechanisms, Schrodinger equation saying, okay, there's a wave function that we put in there, and we're able to calculate not exactly where it is, but more or less where it is likely to be. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is the whole basis of this, without which we don't have any of this quantum physics. So everything is uncertain. That means everything is Maya. Nothing is fixed. Everything is approximate. When we go to Einstein's special relativity equation, he says that the total time space separation between two events goes to zero. There's no difference between the perceived and the perceiver. It looks different. And Einstein knew it, and the equation works countless times, countless times, so it's true. It's a geometric equation. And it means you can take away space and take away time, please. These do not really exist. Einstein was famous for writing a letter. Time is an illusion, but a very real looking one. Very real one. It's very persistent. Yeah. So, all right, we get the sense of time, but it's only relevant to us. We are the only ones who register a series of changes, and it's in our favor. What is the favor? This illusion of time gives us the opportunity to have units of seconds where we can determine what we want to put in it. And we can put noblest thoughts, elevating thoughts, non-egoistic thoughts, thoughts of love and generosity and truth and beauty and goodness and love and harmony, everything that every religious figure puts in, whether it's theistic or atheistic, whether it's Jainism or Buddhism, which are essentially agnostic to atheistic situations, or Sankhya, which is atheistic, they all say the same. The problem is the mind. That's your problem. And the mind is a series of all kinds of agitated waves. Please calm the waves. How will you do it? You'll put a neutralizing wave in that neutralizes the Rajas and Tamas. And there you get a revelation just as when you shine the light of lamp of knowledge onto the so-called snake. And there you find there's the truth. 
And the, uh, the simile is that of a lake where in the lake all the waves are agitated. And once they're calm, you can see the bottom clarity there. And that's why Jesus says, you know, the, that, uh, you know, um, blessed are, what? The, the pure in heart. They shall see God. A very profound statement, a philosophical statement, a practical statement. Take all the noble qualities that humanity is capable of and put them in. And they, to be noble, they have to be devoid of self-interest. Put those in and see what happens. Do it systematically, not just once, not just twice, but constantly do it. Play a game like that, a game of guiding thought. A game of putting sattva in wherever you find rajas and tamas. Wherever you find disturbance, egoistic activity, anxiety, lack of calmness, lack of settlement, disturbance in the mind, anxiety, essentially. Wherever that comes, whether there's anger followed by guilt, followed by remorse, followed by darkness, followed by depression, let them come if they like. Come if you like, stay if you can, go if you must, put something new in. Strong, true, wise, full, free, truth, beauty, goodness, love. Condition the mind in this way. See what happens. All of that gets calmed and a revelation of the truth happens from within. An aha moment comes and you sustain that again and again and again. And what's the motive behind it if there's such a thing as a motive? Well, the effects will be enormous ecstatic joy a kind of internal uplift, a kind of internal rapture where all the senses climb up in a glorious rapture. If you can sustain that, not only will you be making uh, the whole of the body and the mind vibrate well, but you'll also be making the whole world vibrate well there'll be a transforming effect everywhere. See how often we complain about the, mu the, the news. I was at a book launch last week. A lady said, oh, the world is in a hopeless state. Then she gave me two, three minutes of hopelessness. I said, I don't know anything about that. I don't listen to the news. Oh, yes, I try not to. But, and then she goes on another, you know, the world is like this, the world is like that. You know, the children, I don't know what's become of our children, our grandchildren, and, and all of these kinds of things. I said, yes, but there's some good things also. Your capacity to speak, I think, is a good thing, apart from anything else. To highlight those positive good things, we find that will outweigh everything. And so we can drag not only ourselves down, but the whole world down with us not knowing the tremendous power of thought that we have the capacity, only we humans have the capacity to transform discord into harmony everywhere we go. Be a blessing person like that, it's much better. Don't drag your own mind down and don't drag others down with it. Rather elevate your own mind and elevate the whole world with it. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Peace, peace, peace beyond all. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Swami. Merci beaucoup. Bonsoir. Thank you, Swamiji. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Swami. Merci, Swami. Come on, Margaret, Swami. Come on, Margaret. Thank you, Swami. Merci, Swami. Thank you. Thanks, Swami. Thank you.